I mention this because of the theme of education and trying to just expand our global awareness as, as we celebrate this day and honor our rivers. And yeah, as I mentioned, it affects the lower socioeconomic members of our family on this planet. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. McPhail. Um, he's a preeminent fish biologist. He spent over 40 years studying fish. He's the author of the definitive work on freshwater fishes of BC, covering 81 species of fish. He has a distinguished career, a very varied career. He actually started off as a literature scholar and then did his master's in, at UBC in the Department of Fisheries and then went on to do his PhD in McGill. He's worked in the Arctic, he's worked in BC, he's worked in the Southern Temperate Zones. Um, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot and it's just fascinating to, and, and a great honor to have such a scholar with us today. So I invite you to give Dr. McPhail a warm welcome. I, I use the uh, PowerPoint largely because my mind is slowly uh, degenerating and uh, so they're talking points more than anything, <laughs> just to remind me where I am. Okay, I, I want to thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you people. Uh, it's been, you know, it gives me a chance to get back into some of the work that I used to do and, and uh, brush up on it. Okay, so what I want to talk about is this the history of the fishes of the Columbia and Slocan rivers. And the Slocan River is sort of a, a, almost an afterthought. A lot of it will be about the Columbia generally, uh, but there's specific things at the end about this called Slocan. And I want to uh, make it clear that I, I'm going to have to go quite fast, otherwise you don't sleep. But the um, biology of many of the fishes I'm going to talk about is really interesting. And there's not very much published on them, but there's a lot of information known about them. It's just never been put together very well. Um, so if you want to know something about the biology of some of these animals, or if you, that are in the slow camera, or if you want to know about uh, silly things like why do most people in this part of the world call bull trout Dolly Varden and the rest of the world calls the bull trout, okay? And it's an interesting story, but I'm not going to worry with it right now, but it's, it's somewhat like designing a, using a committee to design a horse and look, ends up looking like a camel. It's that kind of screw up that's involved. Okay, so first is that the Columbia River is an old river. Okay. Uh, it's at least 12 million years old, probably quite considerably older. But, and it makes it one of the oldest rivers in the world. Uh, the, it has an incredibly complex history of, particularly the geological history. Um, there's been all sorts of volcanism that has affected the drainage system and which way it was draining. Uh, there are all sorts of mountain building you know, going up. I mean, for example, the Coast Range is a relatively recent mountain range, about three or four million years ago, uh, whereas the Rockies are much older. Uh, so there's been all sorts of mountain building, drainage changes, the fault the volcanoes going off, and like more recently, glaciation, just ice moving down over the whole place. Okay, so there are two events about it that are really important about the and really important to affect the fish fauna of the Columbia River and ultimately the Slocan River. I know these two events are uh, first the capture of the Snake River and uh, go to the next. Uh, okay, the capture of the Snake River. Now this is the. Come on, work. I should change the back. 
case before I came. It doesn't matter. Okay, in the center of the slide, uh, you see the big lake, uh, and that, that is uh, southern um, Idaho. Okay, it's a geological uh, survey map of southern Idaho with the drainages uh, shown in blue, the, the river drainages. And the thing to look at is that there's a very large uh, lake here. And this is so-called ancient Lake Idaho. And it has been around, it was around for a very long period of time. It changed its uh, water level with drought periods and then heavy water periods. Uh, so it went up and down. But the thing to notice is that this is the, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, the Paleo uh, Snake River running down into the Columbia. And you will notice that it's not connected. There's a gap here. Yeah. And the, so that was the, this ancient Idaho Lake did not drain into the Columbia system. Okay. What it drained is it drained south and then west into uh, an area that people think probably just between or on the border between California and uh, Oregon, the, into the North Pacific at that point. Okay, so, can I have the next slide, please? Then in the Pliocene, and the Pliocene went for about uh, eight to, well, a little less than eight, to, uh, certainly six million years ago. Okay. But in the late Pliocene, about roughly two million years ago, the drainage changed. Earth movements, tectonic faults, this sort of thing, changed the drainage. And this ancient Idaho lake ran that turned up. The Snake River captured it, essentially. And the snake was in the big Columbia drainage. And the Snake River is still the major tributary of the Columbia River. And what that happened there was all the fish that were in this lake system, and there were many, uh, we have a very good fossil record of it, uh, had opportunity to enter the Columbia and uh, sort of boost the uh, number of species in the Columbia River. And I'll go into that in more detail in a, in a moment. Okay? Okay, the other important event that occurred was glaciation. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is basically uh, the last uh, major ice sheet, okay? And about, it's North America about 20,000 years ago, roughly. And you'll notice these green areas out yeah, there. These are glacial refugia. These are places that were not covered in ice. Okay? But these ice sheets, the Laurentide Ice Sheet and the Cordilleran Ice Sheet, particularly in terms of the Columbia River, pushed south and um, it's very close to the 49th parallel that they stopped, but they came down in a few places, down into uh, the Columbia Drainage, but they covered the entire Canadian portion of the Columbia drainage. So the, the thing was that the Columbia, Canadian portion of the Columbia, including the slow can, was just swept clean. There was nothing, no fish there. But as the ice retreated, they could move back up into these areas. Uh, you notice that there's a bearing for refugium up there, which is kind of interesting uh, uh, because you think, gosh, in, in Alaska and a little bit of Siberia, uh, there'd be an awful lot of ice. But in fact, it was a Arctic desert. There's just not enough precipitation to make ice sheets. Uh, so it remained as a, uh, a refuge. And there's some really interesting fish that live up in that area that found nowhere else in the world. Okay.
But from our point of view, it's the Pacific refugia and where these fish came from that we'll deal with. Okay. Now, our knowledge of what fishes were in the Columbia before the ice sheets came, okay, uh, is limited. But there is one superb fossil site in eastern Washington, uh, the, the site called the Ringgold Formation. And the Ringgold Formation is roughly uh, somewhere around four and a half million years old. And they're just wonderful fossils in that area. And lots of fossil fish. Okay, so that's where we get our basic information about what was in the Columbia River. Uh, no, I should have I lost track of myself. But this shows the uh, close-up of the Pacific Refugium and the Green, or not the green, the, the, the blue is the uh, maximum extent of the ice sheet, the last ice sheet, so about 20,000 years ago. And one thing to take a look at is obviously the whole Kootenai system was covered in ice. Uh, so Canada River obviously was covered in ice. Uh, as the ice retreated, the first plate, well, this Lake Nizazula, you may have, may have heard of it. Okay, there was a nice dam here uh, that stopped the flow of water. It had no place to go, essentially. And it created this lake. It was a huge lake, one of the biggest lakes in North America, ever seen in North America. But what's interesting about it is that when it filled up to a certain point, it lifted the ice. And it was like pulling the plug out of a bathtub. It just went whoosh, down the Columbia River. And any of you familiar with Washington State, and particularly the channel uh, scablands of Washington State, you can see, you know, you can, from an aerial view, you can see, hey, that has just been washed clean. Um, it didn't happen just once. There are some people who think it happened at least 40 times. But it probably had a very big effect on uh, the fishes. <laughs> All that water moved them around.